I have the pleasure of introducing today this, this, our speaker, Kelly, Professor Kelly Hammond. Um, some, some technical issues first. So this lecture will be recorded and will be uploaded to the Weatherhead YouTube channel uh, later. So if you don't manage to make all of it, or if you have friends who want to catch it later, it will be available there very soon. Also, while Professor Hammond is speaking, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box which should be visible at the bottom of the screen. And later I will read them out uh, and moderate after Kelly has finished with her presentation. Well, without further ado, we'll get into it. Um, as a professor in East Asian history, she did her PhD at Georgetown, graduating in 2015, is also currently on two different editorial boards of 20th Century China and recently was appointed associate editor at the Journal of Asian Studies, uh, Modern China section. And of course, her book, China's Muslims and Japan's Empire, Centering Islam in the Second World War, came out just last year with the University of North Carolina Press. So without further ado, I'd like to turn over to, to Kelly to talk about this book uh, and um, let us hear all about it. So thank you, Kelly. Great, thank you, Paul, for that very nice introduction. And I also would just like to thank um, Athena who helps organize these webinars and she always does such a great job of communicating with the panelists and sort of making sure that everyone knows where they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to be doing at this, the right time. And I would also just like to thank the Weatherhead Institute for um, hosting this uh, talk today. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm just going to share my screen. I have a, um, a a PowerPoint um, to hopefully show some visualizations of some of the things I'm talking about. And um, I would just like to mention um, as I start, and I'll mention this again at the end, that um, I really would appreciate or enjoy communicating with people after the talk is over. So I've put my email here um, on, the, on the first slide and you can find me quite easily on Twitter. So if you um, have any questions or any ideas, um, please feel free to contact me um, after um, we're done here today. So um, I think one, two of the, the, the reason that I titled my talk the way I did, Supporting the Faith, Building the Empire, is that um, these are sort of two interrelated things that go together in, in my book um, that came out last year. And so what I'd like to sort of do today is explore um, some of the themes that are present in my book and talk a little bit about how these two things I think um, are interrelated, especially when um, contemplating the way that the Japanese empire um, approached the handling of Muslim sub subjects, um, not only within their imperial project, but beyond it as well. So um, I'm just going to sort of go over some of the objectives that I had with the book, as well as some of the research questions. And then I'm going to sort of preempt some of my conclusions for people that might not have had the chance to um, read the book before I sort of explore a couple of the specific policies um, that the Japanese implemented with regards to, to Muslim populations. So um, the first, the, one of the first things that I wanted to do um, when I started my, my PhD many, many moons ago, um, I was really interested in the, the sort of lack of work on the history of collaboration in China during the Second World War, because it's such, a, it's such an important part of the historiography of, of the European theater and European wars. So I sort of started digging into this. And then I realized that there weren't really any um, monographs about um, ethnic minorities um, and their participation or involvement during the Second World War. And so one of the things that I wanted to do with this book is sort of reinsert um, Sino-Muslims or Chinese Muslims into the historiography of World War II. And here um, in my work, I sort of distinguish uh, between these, these people that are now known as the Hui, or who I call Sino-Muslims, who are interchangeably often called Chinese Muslims, with other groups like the Uyghurs or the Kazakhs or the Kyrgyz. And I, I'm happy to um, field questions about these, these other Muslim populations in, in the question and answer period. But specifically, my work deals um, with um, these Sino-Muslim populations. Uh, Chinese speaking generally live um, and these, the, 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 men, the men and women that I deal with are, are generally living in large urban centers like Beijing or um, other cities uh, throughout North China. 
Um, the other thing I was hoping to do with my book was to sort of reinstate agency to the Sino Muslim population in early 20th state building projects in China. And um, by this, I mean, um, I always sort of felt that you know, the, 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 the historiography about the ways that different people were trying to sort of assert their own different types of ethnic and religious identities in the 20th century was a little bit lacking. And I thought that, you know, what sort of came clear to me was that um, as I was doing research for this book was that um, Muslim populations were not always super excited or super happy with the sort of what the nationalists were offering to them or what the Chinese communists were offering to them. And in many cases, um, Sino-Muslims, along with other minority populations, sort of looked to other um, looked to other actors such as the Soviets or the Japanese, perhaps the British, um, in order to support um, state building projects or reform projects within um, what we would now call the Chinese nation state. And um, another objective that I had was to sort of examine state building efforts on the margins among non-Han Chinese people. And I think that this is something that um, is sort of common now or is sort of a thread that's running through um, Chinese borderlands history is really sort of using the state building projects that are taking place on the margins or on the periphery and refracting those back on questions of, of what it meant to be Han Chinese in, in the early 20th century. So um, through the lens of collaboration um, with Muslims in the Japanese empire, um, I think that these were some of the ways that I was hoping to address um, questions that I had been thinking about, I've been thinking about for a long time. So um, what I'm going to do today is I'm briefly going to examine three tangible policies that were implemented by the Japanese to help support uh, Muslims and support Islam in, in, in North China first and then later on throughout um, the empire and in some cases beyond it. Um, one of these policies was the opening and supporting of Islamic schools. Um, the second policy that I'm going to speak specifically about was sending Hajj delegations to Mecca, so Japanese-sponsored Hajj delegations. And the third is a little bit um, further, further reaching, uh, but definitely was re definitely required the support and help of Muslim populations, and that was um, to develop a coordinated global tea policy. Excuse me. And then this has to do... Um, with the, uh, the other theme that I think is running through my book about building and supporting the empire. And what I do argue in my book is that through propaganda, which featured Muslims as kind of quote unquote success stories of the benevolence of the Japanese empire, um, the, the Japanese were able to sort of present themselves as anti-Western, anti-Soviet supporters who also then um, supported religious freedom within the empire. And, um, you know, a lot of us are already aware that many Muslims in this time were, were staunchly anti-Western and were staunchly anti-communist. And so the, the sort of appeals that Japan, the Japanese empire was making to these Muslims would not have been perhaps too, too far held, too far away from things that they had already considered or too, things, too far away from things that they were already thinking about themselves. So um, some of the research questions that I approached when I was uh, performing or doing research that spanned, essentially um, I spent a, a, a lot of time between 2008 and 2011 on the Chinese mainland and then a year, 18 months or so doing research in um, Beijing and the surrounding areas. And then uh, from 2011 to 2012 and then an extended periods of time in, in Japan followed by more research after I was finished my PhD. Um, the questions that sort of evolved from my research were, what were actually the motivations for, of the Japanese empire for supporting Muslims in China? And what did they actually hope to benefit from this? And um, were they actually successful? And why and how? What do these efforts tell us about the position of Muslims in China in the 1930s? And uh, what I did, what I did want to find out was how did the Chinese nationalist and the Chinese communists respond? Um, because in the sort of way that the history of World War II is told through a sort of Chinese nationalist perspective, it's the story is that everyone resisted the Japanese Empire, and I knew that wasn't the case. 
Um, so I knew that the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese communists had to be sort of watching and admiring or watching and thinking about what the Japanese were doing and how they were, how they were, you know, uh, sorry, how they were sort of pulling off some of these, uh, some of these reform efforts among Muslim populations. And so uh, I did find a number of really important and interesting documents that did show that the Chinese nationalists especially were extremely concerned um, and very worried with what the Chinese com with what with the Japanese were doing and that that translated into actually responding and so the, some of the ways that the Chinese nationalists were operating in the 1920s and 1930s and then in the 1940s were actually direct responses to what they perceived to be um, Japanese success and then so finally, um, some of the conclusions that I draw in my book are that the Japanese were definitely successful in recruiting Muslim populations in occupied China through specific policies, but only to a certain degree. And here, I think this helps um, this idea that it was only to a certain degree helps reinstate agency to these Sino Muslims as sort of active power brokers in their own decision making processes. Um, so, you know, the Japanese essentially would say like, oh, we want to implement these policies and there would, they would get pushback. And so there was like a sort of interaction and mediation. There wasn't just a sort of direct imposition of a lot of these policies. And like I mentioned, um, the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese communists were very well aware of the Japanese efforts to curry favors to Muslims and responded to these successes in kind. So um, in terms of sort of larger, larger conclusions, I, I argue that Sino-Muslims who participated in empire building projects became um, what Robert Cruz identifies as quote unquote imperial cosmopolitans. Um, these people traveled extensively throughout the Japanese empire. Um, uh, many of them spent uh, time in Tokyo. Many of them interacted and uh, created networks with Muslims from other places in the empire, as well as beyond the empire um, in Tokyo. And um, I don't think that they, I think they sort of imagined themselves as participating in, uh, in these networks in a, in a very uh, cosmopolitan type of way. Um, another conclusion that I hope comes through in the book is that there was no united Muslim voice of resistance against the Japanese during the war, but rather a plethora of voices with competing agendas. And finally, in the words of Adib Khalid in his fabulous book, Making Uzbekistan, the Japanese were able to both locate different actors and examine how they mobilized both symbolically and materially to achieve their goals. So by, you know, locating and finding these Muslim actors who were actively looking to implement reform agendas, they were also able to implement, you know, they were also able to, the Japanese empire was also able to present itself as a sort of um, protector of Islam, um, as a place that uh, practiced religious freedom, um, as a place that helped subvert um, Soviet communism and Western imperialism. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to start by um, looking at a, a really important group of uh, Muslims that lived uh, in the home islands. Um, so the, the, obviously there were not very many Muslims in Japan um, from the late 19th century as interest grew in Islam, there were you know, a handful of converts. There were a few um, South Asian traders, a couple communities um, in Nagoya and in Kobe, especially of South Asian traders. And then um, after the Russian Revolution, uh, a, a pretty substantial group of Volga Tatars uh, made their way across to Siberia and made their way to Tokyo, um, fleeing Bolshevik, Bolshevik persecution and were actually naturalized by the Japanese government. And these young students, um, as well as their parents were regularly sort of trotted out for propaganda purposes. So here we see um, these young Muslim women who obviously do not look Japanese, um, you know, praying for the success of the Japanese alliance, Japanese German alliance against Bolshevism. 
And so by the time the, the, that Japanese policymakers and Japanese you know, militarists made their way to North or started sort of actively recruiting and actively working with Muslims in, in North China, there was already um, a group of pe people that were living on the home islands that had sort of been naturalized and were being um, used extensively to sort of express the religious freedom of the Japanese empire. So here again, um, this is uh, this is from a, a children's magazine called Kodomo, and uh, it was it was published to coincide with the opening of the Tokyo Mosque in 1938. And we see here that these young Tatar students are um, at the Tokyo Islamic School and they're learning Japanese and uh, quote unquote um, Arabic, although um, this, this script is closer to what would be called something like East Turkestani, which is based on um, Chagatai, which becomes sort of modern Uyghur. Um, so, you know, they're learning quote unquote Arabic and Japanese. And um, this was sort of meant to show young children that there are different types of people, I guess, living in the Japanese empire that were um, Muslims. So this, this, this is really an important part uh, of this project that I think is a little bit different from the way that the Japanese um, empire mobilized um, support for Muslim, uh, sorry, support for Buddhists or um, maybe especially Buddhists. Yeah, let's just stay with Buddhists. Um, because there were so few Muslims uh, that lived in the Japanese home islands, they really had to work very hard to make these people um, legible and understandable and I think through propaganda and outreach efforts like this, this just sort of showing this, you know, this young girl um, reading Japanese, like using a, you know, an elementary school Japanese textbook, learning how to read Japanese. I think it really helped, um, you know, normal people that living within the empire to sort of understand the, the place and the role of, of Muslims. So by the time um, Manchukuo was established, they had the, the Japanese Imperial Project had a, a number had you know a, a case study and used this um, extensively in their justification for the opening and establishment or the maintenance and um, overtaking uh, of Muslim schools on the Chinese mainland. And um, in their justifications for teaching Japanese language to young Muslims, they regularly sort of touted these Tatar minorities um, as a sort of model of children who could easily learn, you know, their native language as well as Japanese and maybe um, Russian on top of that. So, you know, just sort of uh, using them as a precedent. And so this is from um, a, a report um, by a man named Kobayashi Hajime and it was produced in 1941. And I, I think what I, the conclusions that I draw from it regarding um, the opening and maintenance of Muslim schools throughout occupied China was that really what it came down to was that there were sort of three main contestations that were taking place. And um, the place where Muslim communities would push back the most against um, against the Japanese empire was when they would try to, or Japanese bureaucrats was when they would try to remove Arabic speaking class or Arabic classes from children's um, schedules. And so, you know, Chinese is obviously for these people important because it's the language of their daily life. And Japanese is sort of a bureaucratic language that provides them space for advancement um, within the Japanese empire, as well as a, a, a way to maneuver um, life under occupation. And then Arabic is the sort of liturgical language that is important for their um, religious and cultural identity as, as Muslims living on the Chinese mainland. And what, what, that, what that meant was that um, I think also the, the Japanese empire also realized the value of having this sort of trilingual group of um, students and they would be able to sort of train them to speak Japanese and they would learn Arabic and then they could be sort of used in the service of empire. Um, you know, this is not a new type of policy. This is something that um, imperial uh, and colonial projects have done for a long time, but you sort of create these new power brokers that operate in, the, in these new spaces and then you can send them off to um, create diplomatic relations.
So just some examples of this. Here's a young group of um, a Mon from Mengjiang um, of the Young Women's Muslim Group visiting Tokyo. Um, I here it looks like they're doing some uh, first aid exercises, um, learning how to sort of bandage people and visiting um, monuments, as well as visiting um, a university in Tokyo. And then finally, um, attending, you know, visiting a tea plantation, and then attending this uh, tea ceremony um, in, you know, so I just think we, you know, sometimes we question the motivations of people for working with the Japanese empire. Um, but, but for these young women, who probably had never left their home villages, you know, studying Japanese, performing well in their classes, and, um, working really hard to, you know, learn, learn a language that they might not have otherwise had the opportunity to learn, also presented them with opportunities to, you know, visit Tokyo, which for a lot of them was probably the most exciting thing that happened to them in, in, in their lives up to this point. So, you know, just kind of thinking about what the motivations of some of these individuals would have been, um, I think allows us to see why it would have been perhaps appealing in 1941, 1942 um, for some of these people to make these choices and make these decisions. So um, one of the other things that the Japanese imperial with the, you know, the, the propaganda machine of the Japanese empire did was it regularly produced and distributed propaganda for consumption in the Middle East about um, school systems on the um, Japanese home islands. And this was meant to sort of bolster and create confidence in the Japanese empire as well. You know, we all know that many North African and Middle Eastern countries uh, that were under colonial yoke at the time were sort of looked to the Japanese empire, especially after the Russo-Japanese war uh, to as a sort of place that they should model themselves after and emulate. So, you know, these types of outreach efforts, I think, were tied in to the the ones that they the you know the these outreach efforts and these reform these policies um, that were maintained on the Chinese mainland, and then to sort of bring this all together, um, you know, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor and other play, you know, the attacks on um, Singapore and Hong Kong, and the very quick expansion of the of the Japanese Empire. Um, you know, by 1942, they had, you know, mid 1942, they had this huge swath of land or swath of area under their control. And many of the people living in this region and area were obviously Muslims. So, you know, some of the first people that arrived in the Dutch East Indies were, um, you know, scholars that were trained in Islamic studies. They were very quick to um, bring, uh, bring a lot of these people to Tokyo and to sort of train them um, and sort of distinguish them from other populations. So this is a group of Moro students from the Philippines who were studying in Tokyo in 1943. They were first studying um, to learn Japanese and then they later trained um, at a police academy and then they would go back um, hopefully to the uh, Philippines um, in order to work there. So, you know, some of these policies that had originally been instituted in, in North China were then um, accommodated and instituted in other parts of the growing empire um, after 1940, in early 1942. Okay. So just to sort of um, ground ourselves and center ourselves um, and talk a little bit about this really important Hajj that essentially um, covers the third the entire third chapter of my book. Um, the plans for this actually started at the opening of the Tokyo uh, Mosque, and uh, which happened in May 1938. Um, the you know, there were two mosques already in Japan before this um, that were built with funds raised by benefactors. And then this is the third mosque built in Tokyo and it was built um, completely with um, government money. So there was a specific um, outreach effort. There was 
you know, there was intention and it was built um, with the purpose of hosting events which could bring Muslims from all over the world together. And I think this is sort of exemplified in the, in the opening prayers that take place um, or the opening ceremonies that take place in, in 1938. So here we see um, all these different people sitting around. We see some um, Yemenis and then uh, some Volga Tatars as well as um, a Saudi who's actually an Egyptian, and I'll explain that in a minute, see them all sort of sitting around, um, you know, at the opening prayers of the mosque. Um, so the guest of honor at this uh, event was Prince Hussein of Yemen, who was the third son of Imam Yehia. And the reason that um, Prince Hussein was the guest of honor was that um, the Italians and the Yemenis in the 1920s had entered into a friendship treaty. And so the Italian, the, the, fa the Italian fascists were sort of aligned and allied with the Yemenis and they were supporting them with arms as and um, other sort of um, military training in order to help them thwart off British, British sort of advances into, um, into Yemen um, on the Arabian Peninsula. So uh, the Prince of Yemen was sent as a sort of goodwill gesture. Um, he first went to Shanghai and then um, you know, went over and spent about six weeks in Tokyo um, and was the guest of honor. He apparently gave his opening speech uh, partly in Italian as well. And then um, the, the, this quote unquote Saudi man that we see um, was actually an Egyptian born Saudi um, he was naturalized as a Saudi. Here he is arriving at Haneda Airport in 1938. Um, and he's later, you know, he's this is he's a really important um, diplomat um, for the Saudis. So the fact that they sent him, I think, kind of shows how important they they, they imagined this relationship with Japan to be. Um, he later became the Saudi ambassador to the Vatican and was one of the first two um, non-American um, directors of the Arab Arabian oil company. So a pretty interesting character. And the opening of the mosque um, really got a lot of recognition around the world. These are from the, these are scrapbooks from the diplomatic archives um, in Tokyo that sort of show, you know, these are paper, newspaper clippings from different newspapers. Here we have one in Dutch, um, one in Arabic. Um, sort of talking about the opening of, of this mosque. So the sort of global recognition from both non-Muslims and Muslims alike that um, this was a sort of important global event so means that it was sort of highly politicized in ways that helped Japan um, with their war effort. And so at this event, um, a number of Muslims that were Muslims from China that were there, um, a couple of them were asked if they were willing to go or they were interested in going on a Japanese sponsored Hajj. And um, the, the one man that agreed, a man named Tang Chen, who I talk extensively about in chapter three of my book, he gathered up a couple of more men. And um, in late 1938, early 1939, they, they um, performed Hajj with, um, with the use of Jap with Japanese funds. So he actually um, wrote a journal about this and it was sort of serialized in a couple of different ways and a couple of different magazines and then it was printed all together and um, this is a sort of this is a map of his Hajj. Um, so they started in Beijing and then uh, made their way to Shanghai where they had a lot of trouble actually securing visas and then they they ended up securing visas from uh, the Italians obviously and they took an Italian ship um, which dropped them off in Eritrea um, in Misawa and um, then they found their own way across, Me across to Mecca um, to perform Hajj. So um, just sort of, you know, using these inter-axis connections to facilitate their own travel, I think is, a, is sort of interesting in the ways that they um, negotiated and managed their um, relationships um, with 
in this sort of very large and global space, especially when we think of all of the places that they're stopping in Hong Kong, Singapore, Colombo, and Mumbai, all being um, under control of the British Empire at the time. Um, oh, this is just a Hodge manual, so maybe for, for Chinese, a Chinese Hodge manual, so perhaps um, they took something like this with them when they went. So the outcome of this um, Hajj is that um, the, so the, the Japanese empire was able to um, send a Japanese diplomat to uh, try to negotiate for an oil concession. And that had been the original plan of what the outcome would be. Um, the eventual negotiations didn't really go anywhere. Um, mostly from because of pressure from the Americans and the British to not allow the Japanese to, to drill for an oil concession. And the, the, the Saudi government sort of presented the Japanese with a, with a catch-22 and said, you know, you can have this large swath of land, but you can't actually drill for oil until you pay for it. So they said, no, thank you. Um, and so this, this kind of leads to this little hole that goes in, into my book in the fourth chapter. And um, I found all of these really interesting documents at the Diet Library um, a couple of years ago, looking, you know, these are produced by the Japanese Muslim, the Japanese Islamic Association, and sort of looking at the relationship between tea and the world economy, and the way that Muslims um, interacted with the global economy. And so, very quickly, the Japanese empire realized, number one, the value of tea, especially in the places that were under its colonial control. You know, it's got um, Taiwan, um, and tea that's grown on the, the main, the home islands, but then later the Dutch East Indies. It's one of uh, probably the fourth largest export from the Dutch East Indies. And, you know, a huge global commodity that um, really had not only important markets uh, within the empire, but growing and important markets outside of the empire. So as I, as I show in my book, you know, Japanese agents were actively trying to um, sell tea in North Africa, um, trying to create mus tea consumers in Afghanistan, trying to create tea consumers in, um, in, in, in British India. And so, you know, this idea that through the creation of Muslim consumers that are perhaps beyond the scope of what we would consider to be the geographical boundaries of the Japanese imperial project, we're sort of looking at the ways that they, that, you know, bureaucrats working in the service of empire, were perhaps looking beyond the, this space for, for new markets and to create new types of consumers. So these are just a couple more, um, you know, charts about this sort of global policy, um, exporting, you know, where Japanese tea is going, where Chinese tea is going, um, which countries are drinking it. Um, I, I think it's important to point out at this time, uh, quote unquote, Japanese tea would also include tea um, from Formosa or Taiwan. Um, and then, you know, this ties into some of the, you know, for looking at this map here, this is sort of a map of the quote unquote, Muslim world. And it's sort of some of the commodities that are produced in these places, some of the exports that they have, you know, oil, cotton, um, sheep, uh, canola oil, corn, rice, and the ways that, you know, when we think of the Japanese empire, we sort of see it bound, you know, we always put up that map when we teach about the Japanese empire with its sort of geographic space being firmly bounded. But when we look at maps like this, we see that, um, you know, perhaps the aspirations of the empire went further and went beyond um, into markets that they did, that they were trying to access. Um, this is just another graph from a display about um, Islam, uh, about oil consumption. So um, I'm, I'm pretty much done talking about my book. Um, and what I'm really excited about, you know, I've, I've been working on this project for so long that I'm mostly excited to start a new one. And um, it, it seems like I've been, this has been, this book has been my bedfellow for, for way too long. And so I'm really happy to talk about it here today with you, but I'm very excited to start um, working on my next project, which is tentatively called Islam and Politics in the East Asian Cold War. 
And in this project, I'm hoping to look at the ways that the nationalist government in Taiwan, the nationalist government in exile in Taiwan, um, the Chinese communists on the, the, the Chinese mainland, and the government of post-occupation Japan, how these three states um, managed and mediated their relationships with new post-colonial Muslim states throughout the 50s, 60s, and probably up to the OPEC crisis. Um, you know, the time when sort of China gets a seat on the UN Security Council and the OPEC crisis is sort of when the things change a lot. So um, that's sort of what I'm looking forward to. I've done a bit of research for this in Taiwan. Um, here is actually a telegram from the Chinese Muslim Association in Taiwan um, con congratulating Suharto for overthrowing Sukarno um, in, in Indonesia. Um, so just sort of, you know, the very strong anti-communist sentiment and the reasons why the Taiwanese or the nationalists in Taiwan would have been very happy that um, Suharto had assumed power. Um, and, you know, I think that this, this project actually fits into a lot of the, the, the current ways that um, the, the, the Cold War is sort of being thought about in East Asia. And my, my aim is to sort of decenter the, not only the Soviets and the Americans, well, to de so, yeah, to decenter the Soviets and the Americans and sort of show how Muslim diplomats and Muslim power brokers were active um, in sort of creating and maintaining relationships with other Muslim nation states uh, during the um, early years of the Cold War. And I don't know if anyone's read this book, uh, Migration in the Time of Revolution, uh, China, Indonesia, and the Cold War. It's a fabulous book, but you know, there's barely any mention of, of, of Muslims in it, even though Indonesia is the largest Muslim country. And I completely understand that that's not her project. And I really, you know, I'm not trying to detract from her book at all. But I think what that does is it actually just provides a space, you know, there, there's a lot of leeway in the work that's being done now to sort of insert Muslim voices into the history of the Cold War in East Asia, in, in I think, new and exciting ways. And so just, you know, to sort of finish up and sum up this, um, this comes together. This is the Taipei Grand Mosque, which was built in 1958 and opened in 1960 um, for the, the 20,000 or so Sino-Muslims who um, made their way to Taiwan with the nationalist government, some of them by choice, some of them um, forcefully uh, repatriated um, from places like Burma. And I've, I've just finished a paper about this. This Hopefully it will be published within the next year. Um, the sort of reasons why the mosque was built, the politicization of the mosque and the ways that the nationalist government really decided that um, building this mosque was a, an important choice for them in their um, early outreach to, to Muslim populations. And then, um, you know, I think a lot of people assume that the way um, that the Jap that the Japanese Empire or the the, the post occupation Japan handled their relationships with new um, states in the 1950s was sort of new, and they hadn't sort of had these experiences before. But a lot of the relationships that they had, as I show in my first book, were sort of built in the 1930s and 1940s. And a lot of these people sort of reconnected. And so I think that some of like looking at some of the continuities through the Second World War into the Cold War will actually also show that you know, how, how these relationships were maintained, um, how they changed, and, and what sort of value um, these people had in, in, in the, the, the maintenance of these important networks. And this, this extends obviously to um, the Chinese as well, the Chinese communists um, who had their own sort of issues with handling and managing Muslim populations um, in the 1940s 40s and 50s and the sort of ethnic categorization and the classification of, of these um, peoples uh, that took place in the 1950s. So just sort of um, thinking about the, all of these issues in a sort of global transnational transregional framework. And so I just want to end by saying thank you very much. I see that there's a couple questions. I would love to hear them. Again, I want to reiterate that if you 
um, would like to reach out to me after this talk is over, I'm more than happy to um, answer questions or communicate with people. And one of the reasons that I love doing these types of talks is that they often lead to um, really great finds like this here, which is um, a, a, a manga, a manga um, biography of the Prophet Muhammad produced in 1971 and 1972 about um, sort of revolutionary figures. And in the series, the other people that were um, featured in this series were Mao, Marx, Hitler, and Marilyn Monroe. And so after I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago um, on a similar sort of topic, someone got in touch with me and has actually sent me a PDF of this and I'm hoping to um, translate it in the next couple of months. And I think it would be a great way to think about the way that um, mu Muslims and Islam was pre were presented to um, the Japanese viewing public in, in the 1970s and 19, late 1960s and early 1970s. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to stop talking and hopefully we'll have some um, interesting questions. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. That, that was really amazing. Um, I'm not sure about you, but I can hear waves of virtual applause rippling through the ether <laughs> toward you. Uh, that was really good. Um, I have many questions, but I will restrain myself. And okay limit myself to reading out the questions already accumulating in the Q&A box. So first up, Colin Jones. Hi, Colin. Hi, Colin. Uh, is curious uh, what you see as the intellectual and institutional precursors for Japan's Muslim policies in China. Mm -hmm. Are they coming from alliance between the empire and Korean Buddhists or from the home ministry, which had refined its approach to Japanese religious communities in the 20s? And how big was the Kuomintang religious policy in shaping Japan? Yeah, that's a great um, question, Colin. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you um, coming and being here today. Um, yeah, I think that there, there, there's a couple different threads and they sort of all come together. Um, one is definitely the, the way the, the what's going on in Korea and the relationship with Buddhists. Another is the sort of handling of minorities on the home islands, such as the Barakumin and the, 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 you know, the minorities on the home islands. Um, so though that's like one sort of thread. Um, and the other, I think, is uh, coming out of Japanese intellectuals and people who had spent a lot of time on the Chinese mainland and their sort of own intellectual curiosity in Islam. And that sort of develops kind of organically and slowly within the university community and like sort of scholarly community of people who, you know, went to China in the late 19th century or were stationed there after the Russo-Japanese war and came into contact with Muslims themselves. So um, sort of a growing intellectual curiosity about Muslims and Islam uh, coupled with the 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 their own the Japanese Empire's own interest as well as management and maintenance of minorities not only in Korea but on the home islands I think sort of comes together for um, a lot of these policymakers after especially after the establishment of Manchukuo um, in 1932 um, and so some of it is definitely coming out from the home like the the home ministry. Um, and how big was the KMT's religious policy in shaping Japan's? Um, you know, I think for all of the, the rhetoric that the, the KMT sort of espoused about um, religious, you know, the, the sort of continuation of the chain five people's discourses and sort of inclusion of um, minority peoples, a lot of it, I think, really did not resonate with people who were not Han Chinese at the time. And um, a lot, of, you know, for the, a lot of the nationalists, really the first time that they, you know, th that minorities became something other than a theoretical other was when they were forced to move to Chongqing and sort of for the first time were actually encountering, um, you know, Tibetans and Muslims and other types of minorities who live in those regions. And so I, I don't actually think that the KMT policy had that much of an impact on um, the Japanese. I know that there was definitely a di like a sort of back and forth and a 
monitoring and looking at it, looking at each other's policies, but I don't think it really had a, that much of an impact. So hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, so next up we have uh, Veda Swaminathan. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that name right. And there's a few more names I might butcher coming up, so I apologize. Anyway, uh, Veda asks, uh, since, in, since Japan's industrialization process was so unique with such a focus on cultural preservation, do you think it had a significant impact on the way they chose to support the faith and build the empire? Indigenous, unique. Um, that's a good question. I think, I, I think that there was a recognition of the value of Muslims as sort of have it, the, the, that Muslims had a certain held a special place, not only within the sort of imperial aspirations, but within the sort of ways that the Japanese empire was hoping to grow their sort of economic and um, economic clout on the Chinese mainland, especially at, at first. And you know, there, there I've I've looked at all kinds of like um, surveys of the, the the sort of guilds and that are taken by Japanese anthropologists and sort of ethnographers in the 1930s that are going out to monitor like what Muslims are doing and what Muslims are producing and how they're interacting with their local economies and the the ways that um, they sort of were contributing to the local economy and. This also sort of ties in to some of the, the stereotypes that the Japanese empire had about Muslims having like a, you know, a quote unquote business acumen, um, as opposed to, you know, Tibetans or Mongolians who they did not see as being particularly good at, um, at business. So I don't know if it specifically had to do with any sort of part of their industri industrialization process, but I do think that they, there was a particular focus on Muslims for the contributions that they made, not only to the local economies that they participated in, but their potential to contribute to um, growing economies and economies beyond the Japanese empire, such as in uh, you know places like Afghanistan and North Africa. So, uh in some ways yes that you know supporting the faith was integral in this case with muslims to building the empire thanks for your question thank you okay next up we have esedula wiga i believe who uh wonders whether you've seen any encounter with between wiga muslims and the japanese empire in the 1930s there's a corrective version down here to my knowledge, there's an argument that the Soviet Union did not support the first East Turkestan Republic in 1933 because of the fear that the Japanese Empire would control East Turkestan. That's why they wanted the Guomindang to control it rather than Japan. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this? Um, yes. So there was definitely interest from uh, the Japanese Empire in Muslims. But I, I think in some cases, both the Soviets and the Japanese were a little bit weary of getting involved in this region. And um, there are other people that have worked extensively on this. I would suggest the work of David Brophy, as well as um, a recent book by, no, David Brophy's book would be a good place to start. Um, and. Yeah, I do think that the Soviets were more interested in having the Kuomintang control control this region because they were concerned about the Japanese. But in terms of you know the the value of uh, um, sorry, let me just re reformulate this in 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 a way that is concise. To to my knowledge, there was interest from the Japanese empire in places in Western China, in Xinjiang, or what we would now call East Turkestan. But I do think that because of the non-aggression pact between the Soviets and the Japanese, both of them were quite concerned, were, were kind of weary of, or wary of um, getting too, too involved in the area, in the region. Um, and so, 
that meant that there was a little bit more of a hands-off approach. That had to do with, I think, the fact that a lot of these groups and a lot of these people were sort of unknown and hard to sort of understand and hard to get a grasp on. Um, and the fact that a number of them did support the nationalist government, albeit for their own means and for their own ends, people like Yolbers Khan and Isa, who, you know, very quickly after the nationalists were defeated, made his way to, to Turkey rather than um, move to Taiwan with the nationalist government. So, you know, I think that there, it's, it's a complicated issue and there are definitely people who could speak better to that than I can. And I hope I've answered your question. Great, thank you. Okay, okay next up we have Selchuk Essenbel, oh, who, has, <laughs> uh, uh, who has uh, uh, two comments and a question. Uh, the, uh, pointing you toward her article in the AHR about Japan's global claim to Asia and the world of Islam, um, and pointing out that Tatars were not naturalized in Japan. They were stateless refugees that would explain their forceful need to collaborate. And mm -hmm. the question, uh, do you think that the US global strategy against communism during the Cold War used the know-how and network of Japan's Islam policy from the pre-war period? Yes, um, thank you for that uh, comment and yes, of of course, I've uh, read uh, her work. Um, nice of her to come and always correct me when I make a mistake. Um, so I appreciate that. So um, do I think, yeah, I mean, it's something that I haven't really looked into enough because uh, this is really a brand new project. And, um, but for instance, uh, I did start reading and looking into the opening of the uh, first mosque in Washington, DC, which was sponsored by the American government and uh, had a very similar sort of ceremony to the opening of the um, mosque in Tokyo. And uh, it was opened by uh, Dwight Eisenhower actually was the first, you know, gave the opening remarks and talked about the sort of deep and important friendships that um, existed and lasted between the Japanese empire. Um, or, no, sorry, but between the Americans and the Islamic world, the quote unquote Islamic world. Um, and so, yeah, I just think that it would be, it would be sort of foolish to assume. I, I mean, I think that all of these powers sort of realized the, the value and were able to instrumentalize Islam in, and Muslims in ways that were useful for themselves, um, whether or not there are any direct corollaries between the Japanese policies during the Second World War and the US Cold War policies is something um, I have yet to further investigate. Thank you. Okay, we have next up Albert Goldson of the Cerulean Council in an NYC based think tank, apparently. Uh, during this period, did Imperial Japan make any distinction between Sunni, Shiite, and so on? Furthermore, were there differences in perspectives? And how Sunni and, and Shiite communicated with Imperial Japan? Um, I think in intellectual circles, there were definitely distinctions that were made, but um, you know, the majority of the Muslims that they're dealing with for all the way, even the people that they're dealing with in um, certain parts of Afgan Afghanistan are, are Sunnis and they don't really have a, a, an influence in in Persia, mostly owing to the fact that the, you know, the, the influence of the British Empire in that region. So I don't really see it being a distinction that comes down at sort of the trickles down to the, the policy level, although it is understood um, among Japanese intellectuals that there are definitely distinctions between, between these groups um, and differences between them. Great, thank you. And uh, we have a question also from an anonymous attendee about, could you speak more about the role of halal food spaces? Um, I'm not really sure I understand that question. Um, well, maybe, like, maybe they can follow up with a, a clarification later, but okay, should we just move on then? Um, we have a question from Victor Lazon. Hi again, Victor, which in some ways is similar to uh, the previous question about the continuities with uh, into the Cold War. So may, maybe you've already spoken to this, but just to, just to read it out. So yeah, with Japan now an ally of Washington's, was the link anti-communism? And in fact, I'm going to piggyback onto that because yeah. I, I had a sort of similar question, but on the other end of the time frame. in that one of the things that I, I was pretty convinced by in your book was that uh, Japan was quite consciously 
emulating other axis powers in formulating this poly this way of using islam to kind of ferment anti uh, allied anti western sentiment mm -hmm. but it also occurred to me that's a much older strategy that i think germany was doing in the first world war yes. as well right um, and there's also the flip side in that you the, uh, you have british the british empire other empires on the one hand, worried about pan-Islamism, but also using Islam as kind of a wedge issue to divide Indian independence activists and so on. And right. kind of using a special indiscreet to kind of frustrate nationalist movements uh, elsewhere in, in Asia. So yeah, I was curious to hear about that previous earlier history. And I, I think one thing that was clarified by your book and your talk was that there's something about many uh, Muslim or Islamic or Islamist actors that they are both anti-imperialist potentially but also anti-communist right. um, and Professor Essenbell gestured to this that the Tatars arrived doesn't understand it not just as refugees in communism but from the civil war right the Russian civil war right. a lot of them were actually fighting during that war and kind of came on the losing side so there's connections there with the Japanese Siberian expedition and so on so that's a kind of a broad series of related questions about the first world war prologue to all of this yeah and I mean I, I do think that it is sort of interesting, and this is something I sort of uh, allude to or talk about in my conclusion as a sort of way to sort of like springboard into my next book, um, is that there definitely were remnants and resonate, the, the, this sort of anti-colonial, anti-Western sentiment sort of resonates into the rhetoric of the Cold War in East Asia. And I think that it really resonated with a lot of a lot of, like you said, Paul, like a lot of Muslims, but then, you know, going back to the, um, to the first world war, there's, there's been a, there's been a couple of really good books written about the sort of relationship between the, um, the, the Germans and the Ottoman, the, uh, the Germans and the Ottoman empire and the ways that they sort of, um, Kaiser Wilhelm sort of really overstepped his boundaries into sort of these, um, sort of displays of, you know, displays of what people sort of understood as being like a little bit crass and a little bit crude. But I do think that very early on um, from, from during the first world war, there was like a, de a definite understanding of the, val like again, the value that these Muslim populations could play. And I think one of the really important examples of like sort of tangible examples of this is that you know, um, many North African fighter people, you know, people were actually fighting in the First World War. And after the First World War, um, that's when actually the Paris Mosque was built as a sort of thank you to the North Africans and the African community that had participated in the war effort. And, you know, what, what comes of that is obviously um, a long struggle against colonialism. But I think really, you know, it's this, it's this, it's this moment at the end of World War One where all of these people, you know, Chinese, Japanese, North Africans, Middle Easterners, have participated in this war and don't really get anything back from it besides a mosque being built somewhere, or you know, um, nothing really comes of it for them. That helps sort of foment this number one anti anti communist as well as these anti Western ideas. So. Um, I don't know if I really like brought that all around together um, in a That's way that great. absolutely okay. yes. uh, and we have a question from Jason Butters my student rising young star of the Columbia program Hi. who asks uh, what sort of perceptions of these interwar and wartime Japanese promotion of links with Muslims have you seen in the wider trans-pacific world mm -hmm. uh, particularly Japanese intellectuals and academics you identify were their foreign colleagues interested in or interested in or overtly opposed to their work for empire mm -hmm thoughts and our connections and networks you said were understood would be appreciated uh, by international observers. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I found totally surprising when I was doing um, research for this um, project was actually how, you know, uh, so before the war started, a lot of these intellectual Muslims that are living in spaces like Beijing, they're all friends and they're all buddies. And people like Tang Yichen, that he sort of throws his wing, throws his hat behind the Japanese empire because from the 1920s, he had been adamantly anti-communist um, and had really not been a supporter uh, of communism. He ran an anti-communist newspaper, which then came under Japanese auspices. And so, you know, but he, you know, he operated in the same circles as a lot of these Chinese nationalists supporting Muslims. Mm -hmm. And these guys, you know, they kind of knew each other. And so when Tang goes on the Hajj, 
um, not only in every spot that he stops is he are they encountered by uh, Chinese nationalist KMT operatives who are living in Singapore who are sort of getting briefings that this group of Muslims is coming you know in India as well um, they, they they get intercepted by um, a group of Chinese nationalist operatives but when they actually get on their Hajj um, the Chinese nationalists have amassed and organized excuse me, a, a group of Muslims who were studying in Al-Azhar and a, a, a number of them that were in Istanbul at the time and made, you know, sent them to intercept this group. So there was definitely communication between them. They're definitely part of this sort of transnational, transregional group of Muslims who are traveling more and more at this time. They're definitely changing, um, you know, ch uh, sharing ideas with each other. And if you're interested in this, um, with sort of the relationship between these Muslims uh, and the, the connections in Southeast Asia, I would suggest the work of another fabulous um, Columbia graduate, um, John Chen, who um, recently, I think it was 2016, he wrote a great article called Just Like Old Friends about the relationship between um, the, the historic and modern relationship between um, Muslims in China and Muslims in Southeast Asia. Thank you for your question. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Benjamin Sinvani, uh, building on my question about German use of Muslim populations in the First World War. Mm -hmm. Did the Japanese imperial project learn from the Qing and Tsarist empires leading up to 1911 and the end of the First World War? in regards to relations and governance of Muslim populations within the imperial framework? Yeah, um, I, I, I can't speak so much to the Tsarist, but I definitely can speak to the, the Qing aspect of this. Uh, I mean, it, if you look at the flag of Manchukuo, it's essentially the, the five people's flag of the Qing empire. And they've sort of appropriated this idea of, you know, the, the, the harmonious society between all of these people that they've really sort of just taken from the Qing. And so I definitely think that um, the, 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 you know, they had learned from and were watching what was going on um, in, you know, since they'd been on the mainland from the 1890s, 18, you know, early 1900s, and were actively reading and absorbing uh, late Qing imperial policy, especially um, with regards to assimilate, assimilation policies that were being implemented in, in Xinjiang. Um, there's another great book that just came out last year, actually from, from the Weatherhead um, Press or through Columbia and the Weatherhead by Eric Schlussel called Land of Strangers. And he examines the sort of assimilationist policies in Qing Central Asia that, you know, essentially really kind of backfired. And I do think that the Japanese were, were were watching and sort of at, maybe not super closely at that time, but there were definitely intellectuals who were interested in these things and were actively, um, you know, looking at them. Thank you. Seems we have a little bit of time left. I'm going to also okay go for it. Um, and this may be unfair because this is the new project, as you say, you're just starting out on it, but um, it. This idea about using Muslim communities as a kind of anti-communist bulwark mm -hmm. um, anywhere really reminds me of the, the role of the church, the Catholic church in particular, right. in, in Japan, where you have this very odd situation where the Catholic church in Japan becomes quite close bedfellows with like Japanese right-wing nationalists right. because they have this shared antipathy towards communism and socialism. And you get many Japanese right-wingers sending their children to Catholic schools in Japan, not because they believe in Christianity at all, but just because it's anti-communist. Right. And I, I wondered if that was a similar potential for kind of almost an alliance. And if you have anti-communist Muslims, anti-communist Christians, are they on the same side in some kind of religious alliance against what they see as, you know, rampant secularism or, or kind of, um, you know, anti-clerical communism. Uh, yeah. And that would be in the, cult, so in the Cold War and before, because... One discussion we had on Twitter, and Tatiana was quite helpful in this, is that from the Russian point of view, the Cold War begins in 1917. Right. So you even see that dynamic playing out much earlier. And you have Muslims and Christians working together as a kind of anti-Soviet bloc. Okay. So I can't speak specifically to the Muslim-Christian relationship. But what I can speak to is the, the, the sort of similar anti-communist sentiment among Buddhists. 
and how the CIA is spent. There's a book called Cold War Monks. Um, I don't know if you read that, and how the CIA was especially appealing to monks who had strong anti-communist sentiment throughout Southeast Asia in order to sort of infiltrate and create networks of um, strong, uh, you know, uh, of anti-communist uh, anti-communist networks throughout Southeast Asia. And so, I mean, this is something that I definitely am curious. I, I don't know if it's going to be beyond the scope of the project, but I'm sure it's going to be something that comes up as I'm like doing more and more research about this. Um, I definitely think that there probably was uh, a strange bedfellow alliance between Muslims, Christians, and perhaps um, you know Tibetan Buddhists in some cases in order to sort of promote anti. And you know the the place Paul where that might be the most prominent might be in Taiwan, mm. um, and that would that would be really interesting to sort of look at and see you know whether or not Christians in Taiwan and the Muslims uh, sort of came together in, in support of anti-communism. It's interesting. I never thought about Muslims in Taiwan, but I guess there would have been quite a few Bormindan refugees who turned up after the war. Yeah, probably there was about 20,000 of them. Wow. Um, and so, the, the, and especially, you know, there were some pretty big power brokers from China, such as Bai Chongxi and um, a couple of really important uh, nationalist imams who made their way and were really important in sort of policy and diplomat diplomacy in the early 1950s and 1960s. That's very cool. Thank you. Yeah. We have one more question that's popped up from uh, Noriko Unno. Hey, hi, Noriko. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Um, who thanks you for your amazing talk and wonders if the Japanese empire was aware of the diversity within Chinese Islam. For example, Gedimu and Sufi, when they were trying to exploit these uh, nationwide and global networks for their purposes. Yeah. So. Thank you, Noriko. Noriko is an old friend of mine, and she's a currently um, at, I think she's a postdoc at Columbia right now. So um, it's great to see you here. Um, yeah, I mean, you you would also know about this too, Noriko. So I think that uh, I think I think one of the things is is that in certain ways there's like a difference between the the sort of intellectual circles that the ways that they understand Islam in China and the actual implementation of policy and how that trickles down to the, the sort of actual policies on, on the ground. And so in terms of um, the, the, the Muslim, the, the Japanese intellectuals who had, you know, studied Islamic history in China and were, you know, were very familiar and well-versed with the Han Kitab tradition, I think that they probably would have been aware of these differences, whether or not these sort of um, trickled down to policies uh, out in Western China on the ground is something I think really needs to be explored more and really is probably, um, I think Noriko has given someone a really interesting uh, dissertation topic to, <laughs> if people are interested in writing about uh, the, the different sects and different sort of Sufi orders in, 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 on the Chinese mainland in the 20th century and the ways that the Japanese empire understood them. There's, there's definitely material out there to do that. Um, and so that would be really interesting to sort of, sort of see. That's fantastic. Thank you. So if you're a bright young grad student out there listening, please someone do that. <laughs> That's a great idea. Uh, okay, well, we have no more questions. So I think we will uh, wrap up early, which is always oh. good for these Zoom sessions. So uh, please join me again in, in thanking uh, virtually Professor Hammond for a really stimulating talk and peek Great. into her, her next project. Great. I really thank you guys for hosting me this afternoon. And uh, it's great to be here and see everyone and hear questions from all over, people from all over. So it's great. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Great. great. Thank you.